I basically have told everyone back home, until I come back home, just consider me dead. Last time they rolled into Iraq as liberating heroes. But their second tour has been a different story. I don't like going into some house and scaring somebody, uh, finding nothing, and uh, at the end of the day, you have nothing to show for it except a bunch of uh, scared civilians. Husband, why? They expect us to have a, a quick fix, whereas uh, last time, it was new. Uh, they were, I think, more receiving of us. And in their ongoing battle for hearts and minds, there is hope. I think we're making progress here. Hopefully this will let them know a little more. We're here to help them. Tonight, tours of duty, liberators, and occupiers. From ABC News. <laughs> This is Nightline. Reporting from Washington, George Stephanopoulos. After days of haunting stories, there was some good news from South Asia today. More aid was pledged by more countries. A fisherman trapped under his boat for a week without food and water was found, alive. U.S. Marines landed in some of the hardest hit villages and delivered some hope to survivors who swarmed their helicopters and thanked them for coming. A world away, their fellow Marines and company Fox 25 got that same kind of welcome when they first arrived in Iraq during the spring of 2003. The fight they prepared for didn't really happen. There were casualties, but not as many as they feared. And there were also cheers and smiles and thank yous. It hasn't been the same this time around. The second tour of duty for Marine company Fox 25 began in September. They've been sent to the heart of the insurgency where they've been hit by bombs and rockets and grenades. On patrols through the neighborhoods of Ramadi, the Marines never know if the next person they encounter will be a friend looking for help or a sniper looking to kill. ABC's Mike Saray has been with Company Fox 25 on both tours. As a former Marine officer and combat veteran of Vietnam, he understood what they were going through and earned their trust, which means we can give you an unusually intimate look at what this unusual war feels like for the Marines who are fighting it. On a day when insurgent attacks across Iraq killed another 16 people and wounded dozens more, here's Mike's report. The first go around, I felt like a liberator. Um, I felt like, uh, kind of like the man on the moon, like we had set, set foot where no other Americans had set foot before. And Lieutenant Paul Chase and those still with the original Fox 25 unit I was embedded with during the invasion knew their second tour of duty in Iraq was going to be different. I basically told everyone back home, until I come back home, just consider me dead. They and their families also knew it could be more dangerous than their first war in Iraq, which they thought they had won and was over for them. Right when we stepped off the truck, you know, boom. Blew up right in front of us. From the early September day they arrived in Ramadi, the capital of Al Ambar province near Fallujah, they have been the target of almost daily IED, sniper, rocket, and mortar attacks here in the bitterly contested Sunni Triangle. I think that on days where they have a, a friend of theirs that's hurt or wounded or, or killed or wounded, I think it's a hard it's hard for them to see anyone here as being a friend. Lieutenant Colonel Randy Newman's 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines, has had 14 killed and more than 150 wounded in the first half of their seven-month tour of duty. Keep it going, big guy. Keep it they going. They lost only one man on their last trip to Iraq. It's this, uh, it's a little different. Let's move over behind this truck. There's snipers on this side. You never know. So you're very cautious this time. Oh, yeah, very cautious. Some of the original Fox 25 Marines have been wounded more than once. Others have had some frightening close calls. Where did you get shot? It ended right there. And that's the bullet right there. Sitting right there. Have a good, good luck. Kind of show of hands. How many guys have been hit by an IED? See, all, you've all experienced an IED. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. How many of you guys have been wounded? IEDs, improvised explosive devices, and the insurgents' weapons of choice, like this one they captured on home video, hit their first convoy through town. The latest variation, vehicle-borne IEDs, like this one shown in this insurgents' video, 
which claimed the life of a Marine company commander in November. Any vehicle that approaches you could be the one that, that blows you up. A Marine doesn't want to fight a suicide bomber. He wants to fight a guy that's wearing a uniform and shooting a gun back at him. It's not a track, huh, Mike? It's like old times. <laughs> Always a convertible, huh? <laughs> Instead of being packed in armed assault vehicles like they were for the march north to Baghdad, the Marines are now trying to pack themselves below the minimal protection of their mostly unarmored open trucks and trying to keep up on the repairs of their mostly damaged armored vehicles. The day prior to going out one day, we welded all this stone here, and then that day we got hit by an IED, so that saved the Marine that day. With the help of Navy Seabees, they have been scavenging steel plates intended for road repairs to modify their vehicles for the mean streets of Ramadi. This is the Marines' version of the popular TV series Monster Garage and MTV's Pimp My Ride. We wanted to try to make it like the Pope Mobile, you know, it could be glass, but they wouldn't give us that. So. No, no Pope Mobile. <laughs> no Pope Mobile. So. I know it looks crappy, but it works. What does it look like? No, pretty Beverly Hillbillies. The Marines themselves are more hardened and protective of themselves since I first hooked up with many of them in January 2003 in California. Thank you for shopping Anthrax R Us. Please come back for all your buyer warfare needs. When there was only the rumor of war and combat was still very much an abstraction. I was a young Marine boot, you know, but uh, this time I'm actually a leader. This time, yeah, I'm definitely watching my own ass a little bit more just because I want my kid to have a dad. You know, you, you walk on the streets, there's a sniper out there that can get you. You walk by a trash pile, there, you know, an IED can get you. So we really have hardened a lot harder out here than we did the first time around. This time, trying to win friends and beat enemies at the same time. Paul, any fear that situations like this may turn the locals against you? Sometimes. A new and tricky mission for the Marines of Fox 25 when we come back. This is ABC News Nightline, brought to you by Capital One. Dear Lord, I'd just like to ask that you would watch over us, keep us protected, keep us safe as we move out to do another day, doing the same thing that we always do, doing our job. Fox 25 prepares for another of their pre-dawn raids on a suspected insurgent hideout. One day you have contact, the next day you don't. Um, everybody prepares for it when they go out. They hope they don't get it, but um, every guy, you know, prepares for World War III when he goes out the gates. After the first months of mostly reacting to and subduing insurgent attacks, the Marines are now taking a more proactive role by trying to secure entire sections of Ramadi. To defeat an insurgent, you've got to be uh, persistent, uh, you've got to be patient, and you've got to be present. And that's everything, all those things are what we are here in Ramadi. While part of the unit cords off the neighborhood, the rest go door to door, raiding houses in search of a man their intelligence sources say is financing local insurgents. The man and his son were found asleep with their family when the Marines stormed their house. Love America. Love Bush. At first, the family is surprisingly accepting of the intrusion. Hey, there's this place apart. We got the right guy. Let's move all these blankets and shit out of the way so we can get in here good. Anything black ski mask, shirt, double black ski mask. So what are you looking for? Just anything. Weapons, materials to make IEDs, anything that they can use against us. Don't, don't scare the children out. At another target house, they find a former Iraqi police officer they've arrested before. We, uh, he was at the water treatment plant that we're going to next door that's adjacent to this. We raided that water treatment plant uh, two weeks ago and found uh, the second largest cache of weapons that we found so far in Ramadi. Oftentimes, the Marines will search every house in a block or enter homes just to take over the rooftops to protect the other Marines moving through the neighborhood. Any fear that situations like this may turn the locals against you? Sometimes. 
Yeah, I'm sure they don't appreciate us busting in their house. I don't like going into some house and scaring somebody, uh, finding nothing, and uh, at the end of the day, you have nothing to show for it except a bunch of uh, scared civilians that now, instead of uh, are on your side, they might be leaning against you. What kind of evidence do you need to be able to detain this man? Uh, right now, the only evidence we need is just um, the resources and intelligence we got from our hire. That says these two guys got to get off the street, and we're going to take them regardless because they actually most likely did something before, but if we do something in the future that will cause injury or harm to you, coalition forces. Why, Bush? Why, Bush? Why? We'll bring him back if he's good. You love, you love Iraq, love America, love America. Why? We need to go back inside now. I think they're getting frustrated that we're still here. They expect us to have a, a quick fix, whereas uh, last time it, it was new. Uh, they were, I think, more receiving of us than they are now. Is your attitude hardened a bit towards the Iraqis? And it, when we first got here, it, it was it was really hard because uh, we were there was a lot of Marines getting hurt. Right now, it's calmed down. Hopefully, it stays that way. So it's going to give us a chance to, to not be fighting, but to actually try to help this community. In an area they call the ghetto, the Marines tried working on the community affairs part of their mission and the better half of their first Marine Division motto, no better friends, no worse enemies. This is a pretty big target for insurgents to attack. Uh, we got a lot of people in the area. We got a lot of suicide bombers that we've had lately. So it's uh, kind of hard to tell if they got something on. We can't really be searching everybody, so it's a pretty big risk. I think it's the most dangerous mission we've done so far. This is the most direct contact these Marines have had with the people of Iraq since they've been here. They've been fighting most of the time, and this is an experiment to see how well the average citizens are going to react to the American presence here in this neighborhood. Uh, I'm mostly concerned with the guys who are uh, who want who aren't participating are kind of wallflowers hanging off to the side, uh, giving everybody the stink eye, so to speak, as, uh, as we're going around. we got a couple of Marines that, uh, that are assigned just to keep an eye on him and, and the people that are talking to him and where they go. While part of the unit offers medical treatment, others hand out the goodies, and the rest take over the rooftops, looking for anyone or anything that might ruin the party and this welcome respite from their more confrontational dealings with Iraqis. We see our cause as being good, uh, incorrect. The Marines see it that way. Uh, some days the Iraqi people act like they see it that way, and some days they don't. Uh, and I think that's hard for the Marines to understand because they believe in it so strongly and know that they're here to help the, the Iraqi people. The Hearts and Minds mission is completed without incident and turns out to be as important for the Marines as it was for the Iraqis. To get out and actually help instead of fight, I think it's huge for them. I think, I think it's big, you know. They've had a, um, a pretty depressing image of Iraq up to this point, so. And uh, to see them be receptive at least and to have no contact during the time we were out here, was that was big. This is Mike Saray for Nightline in Ramadi, Iraq. Mohammed, Mohammed, good, excellent. Coming up, the mission will only get tougher with the Iraqi elections at the end of the month. Mike Saray joins me. And Mike Saray joins us now from our affiliate KGO in San Francisco. And Mike, the thing that shines through in this piece is that these guys are just aching to do good and scared to death because they never know which of these Iraqis that they're out to help are trying to kill them. How do they keep from hating all Iraqis? Well, that's the complexity of fighting an insurgency. And for the first three months that they've been there, they've been fighting the Iraqis almost constantly. The actual week we were there was the first time they ever had a chance to do a hearts and minds mission, as they call it. And they said it was as important for them to do it as well as for the Iraqis because they were losing contact, the personal contact with the Iraqis. So it's a very difficult uh, situation for them as they go into these homes uh, suspecting the worst but trying not to be overtly aggressive or more aggressive than they have to be. And where do they target their anger? They target their anger pretty much at the insurgents when and if they could find them. So they're always ready to engage the insurgents. The frustration comes, they can't always find them because the nature of insurgency is, is that the enemy sets the time and place for the, the contact. That's their greatest frustration. They know they can win all the battles on the battlefield. 
They're concerned about being able to win the long-term war of this insurgency because they cannot mass their firepower and their technology to take on the enemy head-to-head. -head. You say they're concerned about it. Do they feel like they've been put in an impossible position by their commanders? The commanders of the Marines are very good at keeping them focused directly on the mission at hand, what they have to do that day in that tactical area that they've been assigned to. So as long as the conversation is kept to that level, they seem fairly confident. They're winning. They're winning all the time and they think their tactics are successful. It's when you talk to the senior officers that they start talking about that there probably might not be a military solution to this, that it has to be a political solution as well. So you can't rely totally on the military to, to win this thing. But, but they're being asked to carry out right now what is in effect a political mission. Exactly, and some of the only complaints I hear from the senior officers is that they are hoping that the political war is being waged as aggressively as the military war is because they know they can only go in and sanitize places like Fallujah and Ramadi and Samara so many times. At some point, they have to cut and contain the money flow and the support that keeps building this insurgency. The military can't alone just clean out all the insurgents. It has to be a political and a social victory as well. You know, you watch those pictures of them trying to, to, to put that armor onto their transport vehicles, and it's possible, impossible not to think of the encounter between Secretary Rumsfeld and that soldier back in Kuwait. When, when these guys, when the cameras are off, do they target any of that frustration at their commanders for putting them in a position without the tools they need? There was no uh, anger vented that way. They, the Marines like to take pride in themselves that they can improvise. In fact, the Marines are always used to not having the right gear. But if some of the guys you met had the chance, say, to talk to Secretary Rumsfeld, what would they ask for? I think they would probably ask for more people uh, and uh, to do the job at hand. Like I said, they're focused immediately on the task at hand. They probably would say they could use more people because they feel like they're out there day in and day night trying to police all these areas. And then once they, they are able to neutralize an area to be able to secure it is another thing entirely. So I think they'd probably ask for more people more than anything else. Uh, they seem to have through their own gerrymandered way, got most of their vehicles armored at this point. Um, there was some concern as to why did they send back the amphibious assault vehicles, the armored amphibious assault vehicles that they used in the invasion that were sent back to the pre-positioning ships off of Kuwait. So there's some talk about that, that maybe the planning could have been better. They could have had more of the assault vehicles and more of the tanks, the armor, left up in their positions. But generally speaking, uh, they are not, they, they don't openly complain about that. They're pretty much focused on their mission and what they can do with what they've got. All of us here in Washington are focused, of course, on those elections that are supposed to be held on January 30th and watching the violence ramp up. Uh, do the soldiers on the ground, the Marines on the ground, believe that these elections are going to be an answer, a turning point? Their biggest concern is pulling off these elections. And in talking to the generals in charge over there, they say the one thing they will absolutely not do is put an American soldier in a polling place for both political reasons and practical reasons. So they know that things are going to ratchet up in these next three weeks because they know this is the last best chance the insurgents have for unsettling the country. So they're pretty much focusing on how to try to get to the insurgents before they can get to disturb the elections. But I don't think they look at it as one of those other benchmarks that they're there to accomplish. There was the, you know, the invasion, the liberation, and then there was the handover of the government. And I think they look at it as the next benchmark, whereas the real true benchmark to their leaving, any timetable they're leaving, really depends on how fast Iraq security forces can be built to take over their positions. It's clear these Marines want to finish the job they started, but would they have signed up for it if they knew this is what it would be? In a strange way, I think yes. You don't sign up for the Marine Corps under any illusion that you're not going to see combat or you're not going to be in the combat arms. That's what the Marine Corps is about. So in their case, it's a little bit easier for them to say, this is what I signed up for, this is what I got. They are concerned, however, about the younger Marines coming in and finding out or realizing that they may spend their entire career either in Iraq or training for Iraq. They think that may have retention problems and recruitment problems more than anything else. And Mike Saray, thanks very much for a fascinating report. When we come back, we'll go to Phuket, Thailand for an update on the tsunami relief effort. It's now Tuesday morning in South Asia, and we wanted to get a quick update on where the relief effort for the tsunami stands right now. So we're going to turn to Brian Rooney. ABC's Brian Rooney is in Phuket, Thailand. And Brian, I know that Secretary Powell and Governor Jeb Bush are traveling throughout Thailand today. What are they learning about where the relief effort stands right now? 
Right now, there is a massive cleanup going on there, clearing away the rubble from the streets uh, and, and still finding dead bodies, unfortunately. The death toll here in Thailand is more than 5,000 now. I have not seen much evidence of widespread international relief. The Red Cross from Thailand is hard at work. They've set up some field kitchens and some refugee centers. Uh, but there's still a lot of help that people need. There are many people who have lost family members and lost absolutely everything they have. I visited a fishing village yesterday that was just basically wiped off the face of the map. So people are going to need uh, places to eat, places to sleep, and that has not yet been provided for them. Tourism is the big industry there. I saw a few tourists or pictures of a few tourists back on the beaches today, but rebuilding the entire industry is going to take some time. You will see some tourists here. I'm in Patong Bay, which was not hit quite as hard as further north on the island of Phuket and on the southern coast of Thailand. Up there, the hotel and tourism industry was wiped out. The wave went right through the hotels, flattened them, crossed the road, and took out the main commercial district uh, in Khao Lok. Uh, there is no business and no tourism industry up there. So there is an immediate and enormous hit uh, to the economy in this area, which is basically dependent upon tourism, George. It's gone. Uh, and there are a few people on the beach here in Patong Bay, but it is not enough to support their economy by a long shot. Okay, Brian Rooney, thanks very much. That is our report for tonight. I'm George Stephanopoulos in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night. This has been a presentation of ABC News. More Americans get their news from ABC News than from any other source.